This is Cute Deezy at the dark. Stay on my page, people. I'm here to tell you. Come on and join me. This is all the people out there that's working hard, can't sleep, doing your thing. We can talk about a lot of stuff tonight. You hear what I'm saying? Come out at your boy. Where you at? You said you up. You said you're doing things. Where you at? So, uh, nothing but Facebook always. What's up? <clears throat> Yeah, QBZ in the building. Check in. <laughs> yeah. Told y'all to stay on my page. Guess what? This is a serious relationship. I'm up. I'm up. Why aren't you? Yeah. Okay, build it, build the audience, keep it going. While you build the audience, I get the music queued up. How's that? Yeah. It was two people. Okay, I see you up, chilling, you with the QDZ, okay, that's all I want to know, who's up, check on in, check out the QDZ after hour show, you know what I mean, got a little music for you, let's see what we got here, got a little music, get things started. I'm the best relationship you got. I'm consistent. Trust. Trust that. I ain't gonna just let you down. And I damn sure ain't gonna lie to you. I told you. This is a serious relationship. I'm not playing with you. Think I'm playing with you? Yeah. Ox mode. Get this thing out there. Right. Let it be known this is QDZ at the dark. Give you a little taste of what I'm working with. See them young boys rap. This OG rhymes, writes, and all that. No disrespect for the artists out there. I'm just an old head. I can't think that fast to rattle off rhymes. You know what I'm saying? But I tell you this. I'm a hardworking entrepreneur, author, hustler, and some other stuff. Yeah. Just got my first royalty, y'all. All 50s. Not bad for a hustler, right? Not bad. The people at the office, that's where I was a CFO at, didn't believe me. Thought I went crazy. So I'm talking to my late night people to understand this. Y'all think I need you to make money. I don't need y'all at the old job to make money. I built y'all peoples. You feel me? Now I'm doing my own thing. So pass the word. A kill I lay. Grindstone for life. That's how we do, baby. All I said was, I'm going to do. Perception came first. That's what happened. My body and physically told me, no, chill. I did chill, but in my mind, I'm said I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do. Anybody out there feel me? Okay. It took me a while to make this thing. And I made it. 
And the story, yes, is set in a go-go club, but it's not about go-go. It's about the perception. I sat in the corner in a rooming house. It used to be a restaurant. It was a dojo. It was all kind of stuff. And it just hit me that I just wanted to do this club. I had no money, no know-how, but we just borrowed things and painted here. And somebody gave us a couple bar stools and then this uh, gave us an old freezer. And, you know, got a case here and a case there. And then one person started coming to it. Then I saw a Cool C. That was my first baller, by the way. First baller walked up on a man, like, come on in, man. And it's the journey that I took along with a good, good homegirls and homeboys, soldiers to the end. It's a story about the hustler spirit in Philly. We didn't have nothing. And we was just kids. Still wet behind the ears. That's what my story is about. It's not a snitch book. It's to take people that went through this grind with me a homage to the game. What's up, B? He knows what it is. He was one of the first people that came by and checked out the book. It took me 20 years to write this book. Delayed one time or another for a significant other. They didn't want me reminiscing about the best times of my life. Granted, it was the most traumatic with all the shit I've been through. Telling you now, my story is real. Of the six year reign that I had when I built this Google club. I really didn't call it a Google club. I called it a social club. The first idea was I wanted to make it a Mel Exotic Dancing Club. A lot of people don't know that because I had a lot of homegirls then. You forget, I'm Q Daisy. Q Daisy was on the radio and I was on the TV. Trust me, I had a lot of homegirls. I was so slick with it, I was the manager of the girls' track team. Oh, yeah, I'm a very nice masseuse. Yeah, yeah. I helped them sisters win. And they paid me dearly. Oh, yeah. Love, love, love my homegirls. Okay? And that's how I approach it. In the kitchen was my mother. Right there, working this kind of business with your mama and the man, you're going to act a certain different kind of way. She was a hustler. My grandma was a hustler, okay? She is the first black woman to have a restaurant in Philly, second and popular, okay? So I come from a long lineage of people that just gets it in and do what they gotta do and they ain't hurt nobody. Ain't that right, Tamara? She know about that. She ain't hurt nobody. She don't want no trouble. She's trying to make a dollar, feed her babies, pay her bills. That's all I was trying to do. The biggest delays is when I suffered a stroke back in 2003. Losing my ability to move, I found myself abandoned, homeless by my so-called wife. All I had left were my thoughts, my dreams. In that Mercy Hospital bed, trapped in a wheelchair, typing on one finger on a laptop, rehabbing through the pain, writing our story. When we were hustlers on the strip in this city we all love, Philadelphia. To my crew, it's been a pleasure hustling with all of you in the thick of night, elbow to elbow in any fight. Checking foes together. Stomping through this thing called Go Go. Put it in that work. I'm proud to say to all of you, 
your family to me for those who thinks I've wronged them in any way you already know I didn't lie about one thing single thing about this game I'm here to tell you man if we give you your nickname guess what I ain't changing the thing, because I gave you that nickname. You know this, right? Okay. To my squad, ladies, I know you paid me in so many ways for my silence, but the more I develop your stories, it quickly occurred to me, all of you have endured a lot. It makes you superwoman. Don't let anybody tell you different. You will always be my phenomenal survivors. Loved as my homegirls, cherished as my friends. That being said, you all are the freakiest bitches I know. To all my haters, I'm glad you bought the book. And the haters bought that shit. Okay, first royalty tip. They bought that. That's how they know. I know what they know. Trust me. They bought that. Okay. I knew the haters would buy it first because they know what they did. But I ain't snitch them out. All I gave is a homage to the game. Let me let me just give you a little more piece. Just give you a little more piece of this thing here. And you tell me if I got something. Okay? You tell me I got something. If y'all remember these days back in the day. It was 1996 in West Philadelphia on 52nd Street. It was 3 a.m. in the morning. The 19th District Police are everywhere with red, white, blue lights illuminating the cold, dark, busy thoroughfare with hundreds of people lined up in the street waiting to see who they're going to bring out the go-go after, after hour in handcuffs. A mysterious private social club, social club called the Grindstone. It has the ambiance of Harlem Nights offering go-go girls gambling, booze, along with Miss B. Delightful soul food dinners. Authority, authorities searched and questioned every pa patron inside. The number one question Who's the boss? Every patron, one by one, shown ID, questioned while officers poured out top shelf liquor, ice cold imported beer. The search produced two matching 12 gauge shotguns equipped with laser light. A couple pistols, several knives, countless bags of illicit drugs. Several patients emptied their pockets to avoid charges. Little did they know, 5-0 were concerned with their petty contraband. Who's the boss? They asked again. The Kingston dread that's arguing with police conveying the fact, I just played the records, mom. Can't explain why. Half-naked girls jumping off hard pricks, doing a lap dance or a trick, scrambling in the dressing room, pulling the IDs out of their dance bags, hiding small caliber pistols, knives. The big raid was here, and big plans to make big money tonight was over. The club DJ had the most to lose. His personal DJ equipment would not be compensated by the police, only if he can answer one question. Who's the boss? Amongst the patrons sitting in the bar sat an older lady named Miss B, dressed in African attire, sipping a Colt 45. Police asked her, who's the boss? Miss, we know you know. She simply replied, I'm a grown ass woman. I don't know shit. Miss B smoked on a Newport. She slowly put it out, calmly walked out the building, untouched with seven grand, secretly stashed away in a purse. The night's nice bar, food revenues, figured out by the police when the donut patrol finally checked the empty register. The pressure was on DJ Max, a neatly dreaded tall Jamaican from Kingston. Man, may not know who the boss is, he replied in a thick island accent. Maybe you will if we confiscate your shit, threatened the young Irish boot cops. They would love to jump around to some locked up house of pain records. He almost, he almost cried when the officers confiscated every 
crate of classic wax. Still don't know who the boss is? Asked the cops, wrapping up amps, microphones, and the infamous bubble machine, which gave a nice effect to the stage for water show. The officers shine their flashlights to light their way through the club. They know the two bathrooms fully equipped with incandescent moonlighting. Matches covered with rubber sheets. The female officer chuckled, saying they thought of everything. The dried up flowers that littered the floor. Half melted, scented candles, potpourri for stank panties. The rubber sheets are good for quick cleanups after dates. Used condoms in the waste basket. Giving away the illusion that dancing wasn't the only thing going on at the grindstone. Grabbing the stash nightstick by the date room door. Now those of us reading this whole book series, that nightstick, keep in mind that's a clue. That's a clue, people. Trust me, it comes back in book two viciously. Meanwhile, the officers continue to check IDs of patrons, discovering these people have come from all walks of life, from rat stars to everyday hustlers. Some were scared about their warrants. Others were more petrified if their wives could find out, starting to give in, confessing the only information they knew. The boss nickname is Q. The state police control board coordinated the raid with the help of the Philadelphia Police Department. Officer in charge was Special Agent Lieutenant Mary J. Smith. She's an older, dark Italian with a serious chip on her shoulder, especially for any entity that exploits young females. She stared, stared at the patrons like they didn't deserve to walk the earth. Her distaste for this club of ill repute Show like the stress wrinkles in her face. Marks of a scorned divorcee raising two daughters on a cop's salary are deep and raw. Agent Smith, a South Philly Sicilian, a crusader type for all exploded women, especially teenage girls that sell their bodies for cash, making each dancer show their state ID, hoping that at least one of them is underage. She couldn't wait to save a young, impressionable teenager's life out the grass of these pimps. The patrons filed out one by one after being searched and identified, accusing them all of undermining the minds of minors, even though no one was proven underage. Thinking of the ladies of the night having to do despicable things to make a dollar, she thought of her own two daughters showing off their bodies that they had sex with strangers. Who's the mastermind of this place? Said the mindset of the champion of prostitute rights. Finally, the police officer found the light switch. The fluorescent light exposed the array of drug paraphernalia that was tossed under the chairs. The drugs were collected for evidence. The good stuff, too. The strip always has the best dope stealing some of the bags for their own personal research. Yeah, they were having a good time, huh? Said Agent Smith. They searched the kitchen. The menu on the wall said Miss B sold food dinners. At that moment, realizing the old lady from earlier was in fact Miss B. And more importantly, leaving with all the money from the club because nobody gets in her way. Knowing her rights is an old head. The remaining patrons were now unable to leave. Agent Smith ordered them to their knees, angrily thinking Miss B was the ringleader that got away. DJ Max chimed in in the argument between Agent Smith and the other officers. She's not the boss, ma! He stated to the high-strung cops with a thick Jamaican accent. The other officers, interviewing pleading patrons, agreed the boss of this club is a man. The boss was described as a very dapper, dressed, black man the age range from 25 to 30 years old. And it goes on and on and on. Listen, I ain't gonna read this whole book to y'all, but I'm gonna tell you like this. It's that work. 
And every day, I'm gonna give you a little pigs. Cause I like uh, I like doing business with y'all good people. And I'm gonna make my show my thing is authentic. And it's real rap. I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you. It's that work. Spend a lot of time on this. I you know. A lot of time. It's that word. <laughs> I just want you to just get into my thoughts. Enjoy what I'm saying to you, man. The boss is described as a very dapper, dressed black man. His age ranged from 25 to 30 years old. Some call him the black Hugh Hefner. But all would agree. No one there knows his real identity, but confirming Miss B was his mother. Son of a bitch, said Agent Smith, missing the opportunity for leverage, arresting the boss beloved mama Dukes. Lock everybody up. Let them figure it out. Who's the boss at the Barry's? shouted Agent Smith. The guys by the front door with security shirts on. They obviously work there. Whining about getting locked up. Who's the freaking boss then? Agent Smith asked again. Nobody said a thing. Frustration started to set in. They started to rough up some of the security guards until the they flashed their own badges. They police from the 12th district. Uh oh. The off-duty cops are paid by the club to keep the peace for $50. Agent Smith went off when she heard the news. How embarrassing would this be if your commanding officer finds? Ow, oh, said the disgusted Agent Smith. City corruption has no bounds. Fellow boys in blue, caught red-handed, making money on the side. Okay, let's keep it real, people. Heads are going to roll if, if this Gets out, Lieutenant said, Officer Bank, secretly trying to persuade his co commanding officer on the scene to allow them to get away with this embarrassing situation. Compromising their image of authority while the spook criminals watch who's black and who's blue. To have two cops working security in a legal Google club? I can read the headlines now, whispered Officer, officer Mack. Shit said Agent Smith, wondering if she should ruin their careers. Their own fellow officers caught moonlighting at the grindstone. Get the fuck out of here, said Agent Smith, reluctantly letting those two go. They didn't know the boss' real identity either, unless useless accomplices could have saved the state's budget, reporting intel about their off-duty jobs. These two gumshoes wasn't snitching about nothing. They didn't ask questions receiving under the table money, under the table dirty money, able to walk away with dirty hands. Among the security staff was a colorful guy named Big Country, describing his job description as the MC, the guy who talks on the mic, watching the girls back while they're on stage, but foolishly thinking he could flirt with the irritated agent. Oh, you should know who the boss is then, said Agent Smith, stated with authority. No, I, I don't know. I'll just keep the party going, baby, replied the flirtatious MC, admiring her Moorish figure with sexy olive skin, probably has long flowing black satin locks hidden in the hair bun she's wearing. You ever thought of shaking him with your mama gave you, baby, said the tubby bear. Swiftly getting smacked for messing with the eggplant plant nigga from Packer Ave. Big country rubbing his face kindly. Shut the fuck up. All of a sudden, someone fell out of the tree in the backyard of the club. The end of it, the end of, Sorry, people. The screaming individual 
literally fell two stories. The half-dressed man was hiding in his tree since the raid began. The suspect, with his clothes and shoes in hand, jumped onto the tree from the second-floor window and eventually fell, trying to climb down. Officers heard him screaming from the pain. The suspicious fleeing black male suffered from a bruised back apprehended after he landed on the concrete step in the rear of the building. Law enforcement assumed the person of interest to be the owner of the illegal club. Police drew their weapons and quickly handcuffed the fleeing suspect, falsely reported but stable. The young, jealous cop beat him with the billy clubs, of course hidden in the end of report. Cracked him on his back and leg, stopped him repeatedly half-naked and bleeding, blaming his injuries on the fall. No witnesses in dark alley. The boys in blue weren't playing no games. Agent Smith is thrilled, thinking she's finally got a man. Nah, people, that wasn't me. <laughs> the officers radioed the, AT, the LT the bad news, negative, on the identity of the ball, squawked over the walkie-talkies while the paddy wagon boot cops Slapped each other high fives. Proud of tap dance, tap dancing on an unarmed black buck escaping from the scene. The suspect in custody is questioned inside the ambulance by Officer Mack. The arrested detainee ID read Harry Smith. This is a coinky dink, people. Harry Smith. Remember that name. Okay, that's a cheat sheet for you. Like, just like PlayStation right now. You're getting the inside scoop. All right. The hospital worker that frequents the club, spending time with the ladies of the night. Miss White, Mr. White, I'm sorry, explained he was receiving a private lap dance when he heard a loud bang. The startled Mr. Williams fled out the back window, not knowing they were police. The truth, he was balls deep in one of the main dancers of the grindstone. She's the one that told him to hide. He chose to play like Spider-Man. She witnessed him ultimately falling and getting his ass whooped by the cops. That only stopped because she yelled out the window. She's the captain of the squad named Jazzy. Only 19 years of age. A tall Amazon with long, sexy legs and seductive eyes. Many believe stress made her look older, helping new dancers make money, teaching them the game while carrying herself like a seasoned vet. Jazzy started dancing at the young, very young age of 15, trained by icons named Snuggles, taught to be a dancing beast on Google stations all over the city, learning the game from the best. Jazzy rarely has sex for money. She loves to dance. The squad called a coochie friendly jump off with a huge appetite for sexual connection with the crew. Passed around whoever needs her the most. Twick tricks would describe her sex as real, thinking that she likes them personally. The only thing Jazzy loves is a mom and a kid. Proving you can't turn a hoe into a housewife, said every failed relationship that ever tried. Agent Smith interviewed Jazzy. Who's the boss, she asked. He's not here. I don't know where he is, she replied. Jazzy started to pull out her dancing license provided by the city of Philadelphia, figuring flash her credentials and then be on her way. Little did Jazzy know. She just implicated herself to identify the boss. Jazzy's living. She can't leave. Her kids, a cancer-tricking mother, flashed in her mind. Her mother's words rang in her head. You need to quit this dangerous lifestyle, Betty Joe. Betty Joe. Jazzy's real name. She could stand. Can't never get used to. Won't ever try to like this fucking name her mother loves so much. Passed down for generations, simply the strongest black woman she's ever known. The only person that could call her that 
and not get cussed out or beat up in some cases. Schoolyard brawls over her birth name inspired the boxing classes. The arresting officers had a ball making fun of her name. They were taken back. A rough, tough, dancing Amazon was named Betty Jo. Laughing at the North Philly dancer boxer with the dumb hick name, the defiant brawler was only feminine when she made love. Every other time, she's a brawling, sassy, talking thug that just happens to dance. Jazzy's tattoo of two boxing gloves on her arm lets Agent Smith know to watch this one at all times. Betty Jo, I understand you know who the boss is. Agent Smith chuckled at, as she said her name. I know him what, so what? Jazzy replied, lighting the cigarette, reminiscing his touch, voice, and the size of his deep dish, which is perfectly sized for a deep piece gobbler, having a huge crush on him from the start. The heartless lover from North Philly criticized herself for being in love with a man that's not hers. In her mind, one day he will be. Jazzy began to drift off in deep thought, recalling his slow, powerful sexual stroke that makes her climax every time. The Casanova bass whispering in the air when he smashed. Betty Joe! shouted Agent Smith, yelling to get her attention. Jazzy gets wet just thinking about the balls. Oh, yeah. Then it dawned on her. The pitiful side piece doesn't know him as well as she should. The one and only Q, a kill, Q, that shit. She didn't know he used to be a talk show host on WDAS AM and FM radio. A historic black radio station in Philly, a whole lot of people knows and respect. His friends call him Q. Or Q Deasy, depending on how long you know him. Having a knack for talking anybody into doing whatever he needs them to do. Growing up in his mother's daycare, selling 25 cent lemonade for two bucks at the age of three. Living next to a Texas highway ramp, clocking cold drinks in the, and 105 degree weather. Huh, them things went for three dollars. Okay. A7, I swam in the Georgia creeks with the daily water moccasin. Played out in tornadoes in Oklahoma, giving a crash course lesson in the wonders of flight at age nine. Didn't drink the water in Mexico, smelling the gringo kush at age 10. Raised as a nomad, a nomad across America before the age of 12. The voice of Overbrook had a natural flair with the ladies in high school, college, and beyond. Turned school loud speakers announcement to sexy dedication for a dollar called the candy man doubling the investment slinging sweet goodies in the hallway at 13 business minded from birth old as is to a successful dental practice that was destroyed by divorce made to be the man of the house at 15 in the force of his gangster mother's real estate rackets Bagging and tagging delinquent Teddy's collecting ramp strapped with his father's 357 Magnum, a worthy end equalizer used to manage 10 properties. Before the store, storefront was the grindstone, it was the home of teenage red light parties with double trouble. Instigated DJ battles between Jazzy Jeff and DJ Irv. Master of ceremony for classic battle between rappers, DJ, b-boys, all for the love of hip-hop. Mentored by the radio icons like Georgie Woods, Butterball, Jocko, groomed by E. Stephen Collins to, to be the young black voice of a generation. Radio activist, role model, needing more than $36,000 a year at 16 when Average teenagers were making about $3.88 for minimum wage in the 80s. Quickly became, I got what you need, man. Side deals with elite moguls. Stars on back stages. Employed at nightclubs like Phoenix as a bag man for promoters revenue. The young hustler understand early that everybody has a price or a vice selling weight to celebrities while sweet talking to groupies with his baritone voice, seducing the his listeners on the radio the same way from working television 
on Channel 17, BET on Team Summit, his path of stardom was clear. The next Arsenio Hall brother, his future dream ambitions were sidetracked for the cream. His resume on the street speaks volumes. He is the man, the boss of his own erotic empire. The talented, decisive leader of a crew called the Grindstone. Personified in rumor like ghetto folklore. Men wanted to be him. Women wanted to fuck him. Betty Joe! Agent Smith shouted. The name is Jazzy, bitch. She snapped. She noticed Jazzy's body language. Trained to notice the smallest detail. Agent Smith immediately noticed that Q had this bitch turned down and getting any information out of her was utterly useless. Can I go now? Asked Jazzy. After noticing that Agent Smith getting restless, questioning countless people in the middle of the night, her response was simple. No, you're going to go to jail, baby. Take it to the barracks. Announced the very proud, dark Italian flashing a badge. Jazzy started to struggle with the two male officers. Her tone danced her body as a handful for the out of shape cops. Their coffee drinking, cigarette smoking, donut eating ways have caught up with them. Out of breath but trying to handle Jazzy Diesel ass. The only thing they, they calmed her down is Agent Smith's gun. Just the sight of the 40 cal, proven to be effective against any further aggression out of the tough girl. The cold steel of Agent Smith's firearm pressed against Jazzy's temple was just a friendly reminder. Life is short, especially if you continue to act a fool. Arrested for what? Asked Jazzy. Agent Smith responded, for being a stupid bitch, knowing a night in jail has scared the toughest chick. Jazzy will not be the exception. Tell me where the boss lives. She pressed the gun harder against the temple, threatening to shoot the forgetful whore who likes to box with the officers of the law. The cold steel handcuffs could barely f fit around her wrists of an ex-boxer. Jazzy's goosebumps were telling signs. She was way over her head. The sad fact was she didn't know where he lived. They only slept in motels and date rooms. Playing the clueless slide zone was not a falsification. They escorted her to the squad car waiting outside the club. The crowd outside gas as one of their favorites getting locked up. Tell Papi I ain't tell, us, tell him shit, said Jazzy in protest to the gawking crowd. She would never turn on the love of her life, even if it's imaginary in her mind. Jazzy is extremely level, loyal, and knew she was would be rewarded. Q would be very grateful and ride off to the sunset together, just like the Western movies her mother made her watch. Reality started to set in it in an instant, noticing his new bitch sitting safely with the head of security, Storm's car. Charmaine Rosa James, a dark-skinned, very attractive young woman with a beautiful, voluptuous body to match. Mistaken as the famous rapper Foxy Brown, pretty assistant, the 18-year-old star made, made more money being a bartender than more dancers made tricking. Rumor has it she's turned down thousands to have sex for one night. She thought the ladies of the night needed a whole game revenge. A therapist to weak, a voice to the reason, a voice of reason to the deranged. Hades could only wish for her swag, class, and of course, game in handling these thirsty, thirsty, horny men out here. Men would kill for her hand and friendship, let alone to be a man. Crowned the baddest bitch in the hood on every nigga's list in West Philly. Ballers and shot callers would line up to the bar flashing money to get her attention. Trust, she noticed, plotting to have every one of them fill her tip cup up. Since the bad little mama arrived, club drink sales had tripled overnight, promising I'll be good seductively 
lip syncing Foxy Brown's lyric played every time she opens the bar. I think good. The teenage bombshell had men dances in order. She was taught by QD how to make drinks. The quick study learned to mix them up in one night. Encouraged to wear the tightest outfits to highlight a sexy body. Best known as the first lady of the grindstone. The raid is winding down. The officers finished confiscating the last of the DJ equipment. The enraged DJ Max is beside himself. The overzealous rookie cop started spraying him with pepper spray. Packing his prized possessions like contraband. Tags as such when the tears filled his eyes. Losing hundreds of dollars of classic wax. Agent Smith asked DJ Max one more time. Where's the boss? The pressure of losing everything was too much to bear. Everything is his DJ equipment. The cordless mites were his pride and joy. Those alone would make him snitch out on his own mama. Well, Agent Smith forcefully asked, Can we talk outside, baby? Whispered the Jafakin, born in Camden, not Kingston, all of a sudden. A whole lot of people got their real stories told when the IDs came out. Why? She asked. The tired agent didn't understand at first until she noticed one last patient fitting the description of the boss. A soft baritone voice said, I'm the man. You're the man, huh? Agent Smith. Yes, I'm the boss, he restated. You're under arrest, sir, snapped Agent Smith. Were you here the whole time? She asked with a confused look on her face. The arrested club owner didn't want to let on. He hid under the stage while the raid started. The crafty boss snuck out his hiding spot when he heard the officers were about to confiscate his DJ equipment. Nobody deserved the livelihood taken away, he thought. Just like that, the infamous Q surrendered to the bar, to the police. The police escorted the boss to the awaiting side squad car outside. The club, the block filled with luxury cars, custom hot rods, blaring sound system, onlookers starting to play music when they escorted Q away. Playing one of the, his favorite songs, Quiet Storm by Mob D, featuring, featuring Little Kim. The sidewalks are filled with hundreds of onlookers cheering as they brought him out while Little Kim's verse boomed in the background. They cheered not only because the fallen boss getting, they cheered not because the fallen boss getting arrested, they cheered out of admiration for his reputation, style, and demeanor, despite the fact he's getting locked the fuck up, adding more stats to his developing street cred, but out of the corner of his eye. He noticed his right-hand man, Storm, a friend since the 10th grade. People thought he looked like rapper Apache with his hit song, I Need a Gangsta Bitch. Well, Storm, a rugged, tough guy who ran Q security force since the dollar party days at Overbrook High. The heavyweight champion wrestler at his alma mater, one of his Q's closest friend and most trusted employee, sitting in the car along with and speak and Charmaine. He knew they were safe and his brother from another mother. Thank God they didn't get arrested. Thought process for the relieved boyfriend feeling like the game's over. Mom Dukes would never, never like to feel a handcuff. Last time I felt the handcuff shackles, it was 1960 for revolution. Declared the bosses give her a life, 17 years of complete, utter torture and hell. The good doctor had to use, cut. mom, mom, please, said the embarrassed memory, telling the story of Q. Deasy's birth. Free Q chant started to resonate through the crowd. Agent Smith looked disgusted. How is the fucking guy admired by so many people? thought the arrested lieutenant. Q 
Hugh noticed Agent Smith distaste for his cheers. What you think? I'm some kind of monster or something? He whispered to Agent Smith, shaking his head. The cautious agent wanted to smack his devilish grin off his face. Yeah, that one right there. That one. Mm-hmm. But knew that might start a riot. Restraint. Restraint was on every police officer's mind that night. Agent Smith tucked Cuba's head ever so gently in the squad car. They were going just as quickly as they came. The boss was now in custody, going to jail for the very first time. Dang.